Okay, it's for me. Yeah. So, Jason, yeah. what I was going to say is that these people in the intellectual traditions, they stand out the door. because they were able <laughs> to argue for first principles. So, they were able to argue, for example, one thing that Muslims and Christians both use in discussions with atheists, right? You're an atheist here, right? It's the cosmological argument, yeah? yeah? So everything that begins to exist has a cause, or whatever it may be, right? And we use that because it's a, it's a, it's a systematic theology that we accept, yeah? yeah, yeah. Um, and that we think makes sense, yeah. and that we think is, it logically proves what we're trying to uh, ascertain, which in this case is God, yeah. the existence of a monotheistic entity. Yeah. So both Muslims and Christians and Jews, as well, like my monotheists, we use those arguments, you see what I'm saying? So what I would say is let's not depart from that. If, if we use it to prove the existence of God, certainly we can use it to also sh show, prove or disprove some things, not all things, but some things related to the nature of God. For instance, that it can't be, you know, a weak God. It can't be a weak God. It can't be a limited God. It can't be a, a imperfect God and so on, right? These things would link to the, the first principles that we'd have found out from the cosmological argument. So what I'm trying to say to you, Jason, is that if we were if we were to take that on board, if we take that kind of discursion on board, then if you accept that there's a rationalization and we can use rationality, then I would just say let's let's talk about, for example, the hypostatic union, because you talked about Christ, right? So for me, the, 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 so just just to kind of go into Christian debate, the, the, my issue with, um, with, 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 with the, the idea of the hypostatic union is that for me, I don't. I can't seem to, it's, it's not actually rational, it's not intelligible. And not only is it not intelligible, it seems to be contradictory, in fact. And, and the fact that, for example, you have uh, Jesus Christ, who is depicted as being 100% man and 100% God, uh, both at the same time, yeah. but then they come together in this hypostatic union, yeah. and then you have, that's one layer of contradiction, but then that, that's one person of a trinity. The question is, how does this all work, considering rationality? Okay, yeah. come in. You said that, Jay, what we need to do is get that to some commonality. You use Sir Thomas Aquinas, the Jewish guy, and say, look, there's common arguments that we can use to establish rationality. So if we stick to that parameter, we go to the Trinity, the hypostatic union, look at it rationally, it does not make sense. Am I, am I, would that I, would betray you? I would, I would say a couple of things. Uh, number one is, have you heard of Cornelius Van Til? He's a Christian philosopher and he developed presuppositional apologetics. So a lot of the Christian apologetics are based on that kind of argument that you're saying. So you, you have uh, William Lane Craig. But there is also a school of Christian apologetics that says, wait a minute, we're not arguing for a generic God, we're arguing for a Trinitarian God, and presuppositions, not just rationality, but presuppositions, your foundation is, you see, rationality cannot answer itself, it's circular. You would agree with that? So, so... We'd have to define what we mean by rationality. Well, well, well say logic. So the basic laws of logic. So yeah, there's an axiomatic. The, the axiomatic, we assume them. Yes, yes. We assume them. I agree. You cannot ultimately prove them. Yes, that mathematics. Yeah, so it's assumed. So, so Cornelius Van Til says, no, we have to go to foundations. Now, for example, um, if you remember Immanuel Kant wrote Critique of Your Reason, yes. and you wrote uh, on the subject of rationality. Yes. And there was a debate between presuppositions Things that we cannot prove, but are axiomatic in how we look at evidence, yes. and evidences. Yes. And you have to hold the two together. You have to look at rationality like you said, yes. but you have to look at presuppositions. You have to. So, you're saying that you're looking at things rationally, but the Quran is your higher presupposition than reason. Yeah, but let, let, let me finish, let me finish. Yeah, but and for, for us, the higher presupposition is the Bible. Okay. You see? So, you're looking at the hypostatic yeah, unit. But, but we're not looking at, because can, can yeah, that goes back, so yeah, of course you can, but just before we get into textual things, what I want to do, I don't want to discuss this, what I want to say to you is that, just as, uh, you mentioned William Lane Craig, yeah? William Lane Craig, he actually takes his arguments from Al Ghazali. So Al Ghazali wrote a book called Al Iqtisad for the It's in Arabic. It's, small, it's not that big. Yeah, it's a small book. And in that book, he writes in the in like in one of the sections um, 
how to prove God's existence. Yeah, he says that everything that begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist. Therefore. So he takes it from he, he, uh, uh, William Lane Craig takes from Al Ghazali's discourse of rationalization. What's interesting from this? Yeah, can I tell you something? Yeah, uh, Al Ghazali also wrote a book called. Sorry. Thank you for so long. No worries. No worries. Yeah. You're aware of William Lane? He wrote a book, and William Lane Craig himself is not just an apologist, by the way, he's actually a scholar. He's, he's, he's known as a scholar in the philosophy of religion. Yeah, he's, People shouldn't see him as on the same level as, like, for example, these other Christian preachers that come out. In his field, yeah, yeah, in his field he's actually quite established. However, having said that, he gets most of his uh, evidences from Islamic Kalam. That's why he calls it the Kalam cosmological argument. Now, having said that, I'm going back to, um, you said that, going back to the Bible, right? Uh, uh, well, our presuppositions are here. So, listen to this. It's quite, you're you're going to find this interesting. Al Ghazali wrote a book called Al Iqtisad from Iyata Khat. It's a small book. In it, the main argument of William Glenn Craig that he puts out for the atheists is there. Yeah, everything that begins to exist as a cause, even though it's to exist, they fully Now, he wrote a book, another book, Al Ghazali wrote another book called Al Qisad from Mustaqim. Well, his, his main argument was that the Quranic text, within the Quranic text, you can find syllogisms. Syllogisms, you know, like, you know, deductive arguments. And so he shows like 20 or 30, I think, of them in that book. The, the irony of ironies is that there's a verse in the Quran, which is chapter 52, verse 35. I'm calling from the right shayin. I'm home with Are you coming? Well, they created from. Um, uh, I'm I'm uh, uh, were they created from nothing? Or were they themselves the creators of themselves? Did they create the heavens and the earth? They have no certainty. Yeah. From this, a lot of scholars like Al Ghazali and even Taymi and his book, I'm not I, I, I respond to the logicians. They use that to make the argument that you know the universe must have had a beginning and so on. Yeah. The irony is that it doesn't seem to be the case in Christian scholarship. We talked about William Lane Craig, but it's also the case of Aquinas and Maimonides, and the Jewish scholar. They all borrow from each other their arguments. It doesn't seem to be the case that when it comes to proving the existence of God, that they actually look for the Bible. I would, I would put to you, for example, I'll put to you one question. What? Give me one argument in the Bible for God's existence, which is being used by Christian apologists. That's not, that's not it's scholars from the medieval period, from when Aquinas came to now, in the same way and in the same capacity as, for example, the Kalam cosmological argument. You won't. It's not the same. The Kalam cosmological argument could be argued to be, um, to, to a great extent, especially if we look at Hazali's one, Quranically inspired. However, it's still an argument that can be abused. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What, what we're basic, what we're basically doing now is epistemology, the theory of knowledge. Right? Same, same, yeah, same. that's what we're doing. And in Christian theology, when, when I'm talking to you, I'm talking to Muhammad Hijab. Now, Muhammad Hijab's not the same as Mansour. Yeah. Mansour's not the same as Ajit. Yeah. I have to listen very carefully to what you're saying, because you have read, studied different things, and come at, and come at it in a slightly different way. So when you're talking to me, you've got to come in to my world and understand. And what you're doing is you're taking your understanding of Christian apologetics. Or scholarship. But, yeah. but if I just enlighten you about Christian apologetics, there's at least five different apologetics, Christian apologetics, okay. right? There's what is called Reformed apologetics, okay. right? Which is Alvin Plantinga. Yeah, he's also a scholar. Yeah, yeah. yeah in the philosophy yeah, of religion. But, yeah, but, but what I'm saying, and he says that knowledge, that, uh, that, that Christianity is true because it's just true. He just says that. Right. No, but he also has a very um, complex contingency argument that he puts forward. Yeah, but have you seen it? But yeah, but the, 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 the principle of epistemology. But no, no, he has first principles. He argues yeah. from first principles. Let me finish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then you have Van Til's presuppositionalism. Yeah. Then you have natural theology, which is William Lane Craig, and that's where you're coming from, and you're not engaging with the, the scholarship that I'm talking about Van Til. Secondly, you're all about natural theology, uh, about William Lane Craig, born from the Muslim. Bless you. Okay. Oh, bless you. You got a call? Yeah.
Gotta just chill. Just chill. Aristotle yes. and the Greeks discussed these issues. <coughs> right. Aristotle yes. discussed these. He talked about the unmoved movement. So these arguments go even further back yeah, I agree. Than, 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 than Islam. They go right back to Aristotle. Yes. And it's, it's rooted in natural theology. Yes. So my argument is this: yes. is that you can the natural theology arguments are for a generic God. I'm not arguing for a generic God. Yes. I'm arguing for a Trinitarian God, and you're critiquing a tr tr Trinitarian God. Wait a minute, wait a minute. And my position to you is, it's deeper than natural theology. We have to go to presuppositions. Now, in 2 Timothy 3.16, Paul says, Great is the mystery of godliness, that God became... But before we get into let the me, scripture... Let me finish, just yeah. let me finish. God became flesh, yeah? He says a mystery. Now, the hypostatic union, when you read the creeds, man, they're very careful, as you would notice. They say two natures in one, but without confusion. Depends on which creed we're talking yeah, about. But no, I'm talking about the Westminster Confession and the Chalcedon Creed. Okay, but before that, because you've got the Nicaea. No, no, no. no. Uh, before Chalcedon, you had the the, 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 the you had Nicaean controversy. Yeah, that's the Nicaea. You got before, the before after Nicaea. You, you got the Nicaea. You got the Apostolic Creed. Yes, you yes, got yes. the Nicaea Creed, and then you got the Chalcedon. Creed. Before, 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 before. The idea of that, like, what I'm trying to say to you is that the idea of hypostatic union in Christian theology wasn't realised uh, initially. The idea of one. And that's why you have to, you have different um, sects of Christianity, you know, um, which have different understandings of which have different understandings of God, uh, uh, of, 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 of the relationship between Jesus Christ and God, or how divine he is. So um, I would agree with that. There were debates. Yeah? There were debates about it, yeah. but they were working towards an understanding of how you bring two pieces of evidence: evidence that is God, that is man, and how it fits. I would say there's a lot of politics involved in that. Can, can, can I finish? Can yeah. I finish? And, and they came to the conclusion that it's two natures in one. And they were very careful, because many of them were trained in philosophy, Muhammad. Many of them were trained in philosophy, not to be too rationalistic, because you cannot fully understand God, and they left the evidence as what the Bible said. So, cutting it short, the Bible... Who's name here? We're talking about uh, Cyril of Alexandria was the main guy who came up and clarified the hypostatic union. Yeah, yeah, but the, he was faced with a lot of opposition. Yeah, yeah, but he, he, he was faced with a lot of opposition. He is the main the, guy. The, the question is like, and, and this is always a question for Christians, who gave those particular bishops um, the ultimate authority for that? Well, if you if you remember the Council of Nicaea, if you yes. remember the Council of Nicaea yes. before Alexandria, yes. yes, yes, there was a, a secretary <laughs> called Athanasius there. Yes, yes, he was behind the scenes. Yes, and there was yeah, he was he was part of the council. Hundreds of those bishops yeah. have been through the Diocletian persecution. So when they came. Some of them had eyes pulled out, arms beat, yes. burnt. Yes. And there was political influence from Constantine pushing them to one way or the other. Yes. Those bishops have been burnt, eyes pulled out. Yes. So they just wanted to get to the Bible. Some of one or two were political, but most of them wanted to get what the scripture says. And so no, but, Athanasius yeah. was yeah. at the background yeah. Yeah. making notes. And then he had a battle with the Iranian, the uh, Arius, the Arians. He was pushed out of his sea three times in Alexandria. He was he was kicked out three times by by the emperor and by the bishops. Some bishops. Wait a minute. And he and he wrote a book called Contra Munda, against the world. And he was the only the one few bishops left standing for this view. And it prevailed because it had to have an authority, not just the church. Yes, okay. It had to be rooted in scripture. Okay, can I ask a question? Okay. You know, before um, Nicaea in 325, do you know that there was another there was another council? Yeah, there were other councils. No, no, there was another council, Rimini and uh, Seleucia. Yeah. Are you aware of that council? Yeah, there were many other councils. So can you tell, can you enlighten us? I can't, I can't, I can't remember right. the detail, right, right. But, but I do know this. I do know this because I know a lot about... Because, because, because this one's very important because... Uh, you know what, are you a Catholic? No. Alright. Just let me hear. But this will strike at the heart of... Um, Obviously, the Catholics, are, it might be a bit more relevant to them than the, the, 
the, the, the creeds and the council. But what I was going to say was, Rimini and Seleucia, that actually was a counter to, um, it came before Nicaea and it, it ruled the favor of Arianism. Well, I know, I know that, but the point is that the ultimate authority. But what, what, why? Let, let, let me finish. Let me finish. Yeah, yeah. The Council of Nicaea yeah, yeah. was the significant definition. The reason being, could it add the bishops from the east and the west? Yeah, and it had the vast majority of bishops to decide on it. So it was the defining, and then Chalcedon, the next one. Those are the defining ones. There were. There were factions of bishops. No, but why, why let, let me finish. Because there were factions of bishops that went to areas. In fact, there was a time, uh, I'd said it, there was a time in Athanasius where the whole ancient world had gone area and there was just a few Athanasius standing against them. Okay, and, and he won. I have a question. Let me finish. Let me finish. He won because he was a warrior for God and he would not give in. Okay. And he held on to the truth. Okay, the truth Jason, I have a question. This is the, what the word of God says. Okay, so that's that's very nice, but what I'm trying to say is that there were, what I'm trying to show was that if we're taking our authority from the councils, that there are some councils which ruled, which which had a counter um, theology to that which was prevalent in Nicaea 225, like Re Remini and Seleucia, which came before it. And, and also to note, it's very important to note, that the entire Trinity wasn't realized in Nicaea, as you know, right? Like, you know, the, the Holy Spirit was not uh, known as a god. Uh, or, or seen as a god in the Nicene Creed. It was only done so in, uh, in, 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 in Constantinople 3 to 1. Can, can, but, but, can, no, can, no, but, but one more thing I want to ask, because you mentioned Athanasius, I think it's very important that we ask a question here, which is, I think it's a fundamental question, Jason. But before you ask that question, yes, of course. let's just take a restart, because we've gone from... Well, before, this is going to just kind of crystallize everything okay. I'm saying, right? You mentioned, uh, my question is the question of authority, yeah? Now we've moved away from rationality. I don't mind for the sake of argument, just let's park that, argument, that discussion to the side for a second. Right. And let's go to the question of authority, yeah? Who has authority? Let's say now, the Bible has authority, yeah? Let's go with that presupposition, because I know it's going to be difficult to tear you apart from that, yeah? Yes, it's impossible. Yeah. So I say to you, look, let's go with the Bible has the authority. Same with you. I have two questions though. The question is, of course, what is the Bible? And then who does the Bible give authority to? These are two important questions. Now I, I understand the theory of apost apostolic succession. And, and I understand that, that can be derived from the Bible. And Just show him that. <laughs> yeah, I understand all of that. It's, 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 it's very good. However, what I wanted to say was this: two questions. Athanasius. Here's my question. Athanasius. Yeah, yeah. Athanasius. Athanasius. As far as we're concerned, in terms of the um, the compilation of the entire Bible, the New Testament corpus of 27 books, he seemed to be the one who wrote the short list of that. However, my question is what council took place in order to to crystallize them 27 books of the New Testament yeah, as yeah. the 27 books because as far as I know the council of Nicaea was not a council and you'd agree with this right was not a council that um, that, uh, that had as a main uh, topic of discussion what, what, what should be included and not included in the, in the Bible, in the New Testament. So the question is, the 27 books of the New Testament, what, who gave Athanasius the final right to put all 27 books, according to his, what we would call Ijtihad, his own understanding in the Bible like that? Okay. Uh, in 2 Timothy, uh, 2 Peter, chapter 3, it says Paul's letters are hard to understand, but they are scripture. So in 2 Timothy, right, in 2 Timothy, right at the beginning, you have there a canon already developing. Okay, that is in 2 Timothy. Then in 1, uh, I think it's in 1, so, sorry, 2 Peter, sorry, 2 Peter, chapter 3. Uh, you read, I can get the specific no, verses. No, 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 no. You read chapter 3, yeah. it says, uh, Paul's epistles are hard to read the scripture. So there's a canon there in the first century already, right? No council decided, it's already stated by the apostles. No, 
what is the all other books that should be included? Let, let, let me finish. Let me finish. Let me finish. Secondly, in one Timothy or two Timothy, if you, you have to get the ref, reference on my videos, but there's a there's a verse where Paul actually quotes the Gospel of Luke. Did you know that? Did you know that? He quotes Deuteronomy, and then Paul quotes Luke aside of Scripture. So now you have two verses that are showing you that there was a kind of. Also, when you read Paul's epistles, for example, uh, in 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, he tells the church, and often when he writes a letter, he says, read these these letters to the church. He says, read these letters yes, to the church. Okay. So prior to the councils yes. in the first century, yes. my first argument would be, yes, yes. there was already a canon within the church. Okay, no, I, I would you agree with that? I wouldn't say at all. Yeah, let me just make my, uh, my, my point or my question clear. Right, yeah? I'm not saying that there, there shouldn't be a canon or there wouldn't be a canon. There, there was no canon. I'm asking the question of canonization. In other words, what should be included in the canon? Rather than it was not a canon. I, I hear what you're saying. Oh, I no, hear no, it. No, no, no. So that's one point. With, with, the, with the thing that you said about Peter, um, saying that uh, the books of Paul should be in the canon. It says, no, not yeah, just in the canon, it says scripture. Yeah, yeah no problem. Yeah. As you know, there are 13 books that supposedly Paul wrote. Biblical scholars say about seven of them are undisputed um, kind of uh, authorship of Paul. The rest of them are disputed anyway. Yeah? You mentioned Luke. Biblical scholars say that um, Luke and Acts, Luke and Acts have the same author. Yeah? So, no problem. I, I don't disagree with that. Yeah? No, I'm, I'm willing to take take this argument where the scholarship takes it. But what I'm trying to say to you is, my question just to reiterate, is Athanasius, somewhere after 325, somewhere before 381, he, he came up with a short list. Uh, unilaterally, autonomously, and that short list included 27 books of the New Testament. He said that these are the books that should be in the New Testament. Okay, now, we know that Athanasius, because of his his political power and connection with, um, obviously Constantine was not a bit, uh, alive at that time, but with, with the ruling elite. It, it was alive uh, no, no, in, some part, in some part, some part of Athanasius' life he was alive. Yeah, yeah. But, in three to one, so, but what I'm trying to say is that we know that he was a political, politically influential. Yeah. My question is that, isn't it just fair enough historically to just justify the fact that the reason why Christians have the 27 books of the New Testament now, yeah. as they are, is because Athanasius said so, and Athanasius was, in, in our terms, a political elite. But there was no biblical authority given to him. Right. Can I ask, have you ever read any of Athanasius' works? His, uh, no, I, I read through Ecclesiastic History. But, what he did. No, no, but have you ever read, you see have this? you ever read... And this is not to show you what, but have you seen this? Have you no? I'm on about. Have you read? Primary source. Have you ever read Athanasius' works? Primary source materials. I've looked it through. I looked it through Eusebius. No, Eusebius yeah. wrote Ecclesiastic history. Yeah? Yeah, let me finish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've read Athanasius some of his works. Like what? Like what? Right. So, so his commentaries. He wrote commentaries, right? So he wrote commentaries on the Psalms. He wrote commentaries. Thank but you. Jason, I don't want. I'm no, sorry. no. Yeah, yeah. We're not trying to win an argument. I know, I know. It's about truth. I'm asking you. It's I, about I, truth. I'm here. I'm it's the about question. truth. And I've, the and, I, and I've treated you with great respect. Yes, yes. And I've listened to everything you've said. Now you've got to let me deconstruct it. So my first point is, Athanasius was a man of one book, the Bible. And if you read his works, he's expounding these texts of the Bible, right? The, 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 not just the Psalms, but other books. He's writing commentaries on them, okay. right? And his book on the Incarnation specifically, he's all over the New Testament quoting it as an authority. And he's doing that because he sees that the church sees them as scripture. And that's why he's using them as well. Like that, that, he's, he's quoting John, Luke. No, no, Matthew. there's no doubt. I agree with that. Right. No, but no, let I me agree finish my one. argument. Yeah, yeah, let me finish yeah, yeah. my argument. Because when you interrupt, I'm yeah. getting tired of talking from Manchester. I apologize. Okay, now you said it's a political thing. I've said he, he, he expounded. Let, let me just, we, we, the Essene community, I'm going to give you some... No, I was asking, just, no, just, just, let me no, just ask the question again. What, I, I was I'm asking, giving you the argument. What, what gave him the authority 
to put all 27 books in the New Testament. Let me, let me expound it now. Just yeah. give me. You can look this in my booklet called Canon of Scripture on Amazon. And I'll send it you free. Okay? <laughs> and I'm going to be writing some books on you soon. And you won't play upon it, will you? I won't, I, won't, I won't charge you. I have to say that. Number one. The New Testament Christians were, com were from the com were Jewish mainly people, you would agree with that. They were community people who believed in covenant. Just listen to this, it's really important. It answers your question. In, Deutero in, in Je Jeremiah chapter 32, it says, I give you a new covenant. Whenever a covenant is given, there's often scripture. When, when God gave a covenant to Moses, he gave the Torah. When God gave a covenant to Noah, he gave his word. Yeah? Often where there's a covenant, the scripture. So that in the new, in the time of Jesus, when Jesus the Messiah came, the Jews believed in covenant, and covenant comes with scripture. So the New Testament people would know that there would be a scripture with as covenant people. First point. Second point, you had the Essene community. We found the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now the Essene communities, there were a couple of thousand of them around Palestine, and they had little communities here. They were well known for copying religious documents. So the idea of having not just an oral tradition, but a, a, a spiritual tradition of writing was there. So there would have been books in the time of Jesus written that would have been seen spiritually. Thirdly, if you read uh, John chapter 17, that great passage about high priestly prayer, you'll find that the Lord says, I was with you before, I was with you before in the beginning. Oh, thank you. I was with you before in the beginning. But he's talking about relationship with Father, but if you notice something, it's in words. So words are what's written down is important. Now the Gnostics, it comes together now, the Gnostics quote the New Testament. They quote the Gospels, the Gnostics quote the New Testament, they quote, they quote uh, Paul, they quote the Gospels, they never, but the Gospels and New Testament never quote the Gnostic Gospels. Now, my argument is this, right in the first century, there was a covenant community that had scripture, a Trinitarian community that believed the scripture, and thirdly, a Gnostic community that was quoting the New Testament, right? And so, what that meant is, right at the beginning, it was no cancel. There was already, I'm giving you two Peter, there was already a sense that we've got, we're a covenant people and there is scripture. Yes, now, yes. now, we didn't have the internet then. Yes, yes. We didn't have the internet. Yes. Right? Yes. So, origin, if you remember origin, right? Origin. Alexandria. Origin of. I'm from Alexandria as well, you know that. <laughs> yes. Are you from Alexandria? Yes. Are you? Yes. Wow, man. I have to come on holiday and see you there. Okay. That's amazing. So, Origin, he went to uh, a holiday somewhere in Jerusalem somewhere, and he found that the, the Christians believed in a book that he didn't even know about. So, they didn't have the internet like we do, so news didn't get round as fast. But if you read, uh, if you read the Dedicate, which is 100 AD, it quotes Matthew. Yes. And if you read, just in Matthew, it says the churches are to do this, and it, and it, and just in my second century, yes. and he says it's important that you read the Gospels and you read the, yes. the epistles. Yes. Yeah. So my argument's there. Yes. Yes. First century, totally. a totally. sense totally. of scripture. What I think you've done is you've been very ingenuous in your analysis. Why is that? You've been good. You've been not oh. listening. All oh, right. <laughs> yes, yes. Sorry, man. No, Thank no, you, bro. No, no. So no. See my pound sailors again. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, bro. And I'm and I'm impressed by your understanding of early church history. And I appreciate that you didn't try any underhanded tactics. Oh, I don't want to do no, that. No, 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 no. You were very honest. And so much so that I'm willing to concede to all of the, almost all of the points that you've just made. That's like, is that what you should say? Isn't it? How are you doing? How are you doing, Dijon? You all right? All right. I don't want to interrupt. No, no, no. You come yeah, you shouldn't come interrupt, Bob. Come in. Come in. No, let, let try, come try saying that to Lenin. We're talking about but this, some, some of this, some of this research. Sorry, hope, sorry. I, I, I've said something too nice to you, because Bob needs to know as well. Yeah, Bob needs to know that Jason here has made some very interesting and correct points to the extent whereby I said to him what I agreed with every, almost every point you made. Let me, let me tell you what points you made, uh, Bob, so that everyone knows. 
Yeah. 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 So Bob, listen to the points I uh, number one, he said, because we're talking about canonicity, yeah, and yeah. what's included in the New Testament and what's not included in the New Testament. We talked about Athanasius, he, he brought it out and we talked about it, it was quite an interesting discussion. Yeah. And then he said, look, there was a, because there was a sense of covenant, yeah? Yeah, the, the Old Testament covenant yes, community. Yes, the Old Covenant community. Where there's covenant, the scripture. There's, when there is covenant, there's scripture. And he said that, so the early Christians, even if you go back all the way to Justin Martyr, and he, he even quoted the Didache, which as you know is one of the earliest church documents. Uh, one of the earliest jo documents that uh, intellectual historians now use. It talks about things like the baptism and and, um, and things like that. It's a small document, it's not that Yeah, it, it's, it talks yeah. about the roles of prophets and, and, and apocalyptic, decorums apocalyptic, of prophets. Yep. A lot of it is to do with uh, the ap right. apocalypse and so on. If you look at those documents, there's no doubt that um, you know that there was a sense of scripture, and you're right because almost all of the f uh, primary source materials that I came across. But, but were you given the four arguments that I gave? That uh, yes, yeah, so, so we so know number one, where we're at. Number one, you talked about the covenant. You talked about the covenant. Whether the covenant is a scripture. Yeah, I agree. Point one, agreed. Shake my hand. Right. Okay. Yes, uh, Bob, shake. Yes, now we all agree. Yeah? What was the second no, no, no. one? No, number no, two. Don't keep going. The second one. Primary source materials, looking at the Didache, looking at those things, there was a sense of scripture because they were quoting them. Yeah. You said that, for example. And reading them. Yeah, yeah. Matthew was being quoted. Luke was being quoted, right? Yep.